Hello and welcome to what Amazon Echo taught me about IoT security. Let's get started with a few uh, laundry list items. As you guys can see, my Twitter account is at Pure Medium. Feel free to ping me if you need the slides, even though uh, Be My App and Intel will publish the slides as well. But you're welcome to drop me a line. Also, if you have questions that you want to ask, you have a few options, you can do so during the chat or as some people have done after the previous talk, feel free to also send me information on Twitter and I'll be happy to answer them as best as I can. So thanks again for coming here uh, late uh, during the day or the morning for, for you on a Saturday. We're gonna keep it fun and really go into what Amazon Echo taught me about IoT security and why it's important for us. Now, IoT is great. You know, there are countless of new devices being released uh, every day, almost, but very few end up taking a proactive approach to security. And for us, the reason we were experimenting with Amazon Echo is directly linked to my uh, my startup and two projects we're working on. So I'm the founder of SmartNotify.us, and one of our projects is really to change how emergency management is being done. If you guys want to, to give it a shot, you can even use uh, some of the code in there to get on the private beta. But we're looking at using voice services and systems like Amazon Echo, or I should say Alexa, we'll get to that in a minute, into our software. So that's one part. And then the other part, we're, uh, we're working on a project that's really going to help prevent fatigue-related accidents. So for this, especially on that project, it really puts some uh, some highlights on IoT, human you know, interaction, but also the security holes around those things. So during this talk, we're gonna go over the security risk. We're gonna look at some remedies to make uh, the product safer for you guys, and also to alert you on some things that we've found using all these different systems. But also I'm gonna bring a few, a few items every now and then to how it relates to an enterprise environment, because what we found already is that there's a big difference between enterprise and consumer product. So again, let's get started. You guys are welcome to ask questions on uh, on the chat side, or we'll be able to do that later on via, via Twitter. Now, the first uh, experience we had we, with Amazon, we got the Amazon Dot. And now you can use their Alexa technology, load the Alexa on, on a device. I believe there are some other Intel innovators who've done so, and you can uh, try it yourself. But what you're gonna find if you start using the dot, it's literally gonna go and say, hey, can I join your Wi-Fi network? And if you're like me, you're just gonna start typing your network on uh, on the system, your, your network password on the system. It's gonna go and it's gonna be fine. And chances are, you're not gonna pay much attention to that entry point. Well, you should, because if you start to look deeper into your app settings for, for your Amazon device, what you're gonna find out is that your Wi-Fi password is stored on the Amazon server. And of course, it's opt-in by default. Now, here's the interesting part. You know, I don't know about you guys and your Wi-Fi password. If, uh, if the servers were to be hacked, okay, someone would have my local password, that may be an issue. But if you start to deploy those kind of devices in a in a commercial environment, in an enterprise environment, I'm going to be willing to bet you don't want your all that Wi-Fi data, all that Wi-Fi knowledge to go out. Uh, yet it's enabled by default, and it's very easy to be tricked into this. And frankly, that just that one item right there already started to to turn me off and turn other people off on my team. Where hmm, really, if they start to collect that data under the guise of uh, it's to help you, you know, what else are they collecting and really what are they gonna do with all that data? That was one of the the big eye opener we have. The other part about those devices is that in a sense, they're always on. Now there, there are some device like the tap, you literally have to tap to to turn it on and make it and uh, make it listen, but some of the Echo and, and Dot devices, they're always on. And that presents a challenge as well, because even though they're supposed to listen to their keywords, as you can imagine, there are ways to, to hack into that logic and to start to record and listen at other times. Again, if you have the Amazon device in your kitchen, that may be some issue if, if they hear you cursing because you put too much salt or pepper in your food. 
but if you're in a uh, in an enterprise environment the kind of discussions that may be happening there may be a little more sensitive and high value and you're going to want to protect yourself against that similarly all these devices have keywords to get them started and you might have seen some fun uh, some fun videos on uh, on youtube or other places but we ended up running into this problem in a fun way here on my personal life. So you're supposed to say, Alexa, please set an alarm clock for this or that, and Alexa will do this. And then sometimes you're going to ask Alexa something, and Alexa is going to start to give you answers that make no sense. You know, play songs you don't want, say things you do, you're not interested in. And in that case, you're going to say, Alexa, stop. That's where it gets funny. Alexa reacts to anything that be, begins with Alex. If you're like me and your father-in-law, pretty much his name is Alex, and you start yelling, Alex, stop, every time, uh, you're gonna get some pissed off people in uh, in the room. We've uh, we run some, uh, some fun experiments around words, and uh, I've listed a few here. But again, there are many, many different ways to get keywords going in and to get um, to get the device to respond. And that's not always gonna be the the safest to, to use some of those words. So in a enterprise environment, again, make sure you decide the, uh, the words you choose. Also, these devices have no idea of who else is around you when you make a request. So while you may be asking for what you think is gonna be benign information, your device may be giving way more information that you need to those around you. That actually happens pretty easily when you start to say, for example, um, Alexa, give me my daily briefing. And the daily briefing is supposed to send you a lot of information about what happened during the day through different news sources. Now, I've read some interesting reports where people were getting annoyed because some of their family members were listening to a certain channel and based on their political views, they were not aligned. So that can lead to, to interesting discussions. Alexa has no context of who you are and what you do. So, before we run into some, some tips and tricks, a few other words about Alexa itself and what we found. Of all the different assistants, and by assistants, I mean the home assistants, it's actually one that works quite well. Uh, we like it better than the Google, Google one we tried. I'm sure at some point Apple is going to release one that's going to be interesting to compare them. In terms of voice recognition, Siri is a little bit better in the sense that once Siri gets used to your voice, technically someone else cannot try to, to do things with your phone. Uh, we've seen people bypass that, but by and large, Siri is a bit more reliable than the other ones. Regardless, you know, remember, and that's re leading into the first point that I have here, when you guys start to build your, your IoT device, and it also goes back to the Wi-Fi issue, be honest. Be honest as to what you're doing, what your real business is. You know, Google and Amazon they're not in the IoT business. They're not really in the in the home automation and making sure all lights get controlled. They're they're a marketing company. They're a sale company. So for them, it's about acquiring data about us to then make recommendation that hopefully we're going to want to act on and sell. So if you're very open as to what your product will do, it already goes a long way. Also, what you do and how you collect the data is quite important. Be clear about it. It goes a long way. People will, will trust you more if you tell them exactly what you're going to do with your, your data, especially if you're a startup, because they are, people are less likely to believe startups and gigantic companies, even though they probably should do the opposite. Second, we saw that example during, during the Wi-Fi setting. Only store what you absolutely need remotely. So, you know, does Amazon really need my Wi-Fi password? No, not, none whatsoever. There's no... There's no good reason beyond marketing reason to do to do so. You probably don't need to to store everything that your user is going to do or ask on a, on a remote. Not only does it take a lot of traffic to do that, it also takes a lot of space. So you can save a lot of uh, of operating income by thinking and streamlining the data that you that you keep in check. And that's where you're going to want to look at more and more at computing at the edge. What we're finding is that computing at the edge and you have new devices, like uh, we're using the Jewel, for example, the Intel Jewel on many of our cases, there are competitors out there. But re really with computing at the edge, what you're doing is putting the, the processing, the intelligence on the device itself. 
and you can go a long way in terms of storing data, analyzing, analyzing the data. For us, in our, in our devices, the benefits were really twofold. You actually compute, in a sense, faster because you don't have to worry about network connectivity. You know, not everyone is going to be on a great cable or DSL or fiber optic network to run the transaction to your server. You're going to have people who are going to be remote. You're going to have people who are going to be on lousy connections. You're going to have people whose connection failed. You still want to give them some service. You know, my Amazon Alexa struggles at time when I turn the Wi-Fi off to do some very basic task. So that, that shouldn't be the case. Try to move more computing toward the edge. You're going to be faster. You're going to give more accurate results. And you're not going to store as much information. So you're going to gain a lot of trust and interest in your customer's eyes. Second part is to be context aware. Now, for us in, in the driving scenario, we need to look at many things. So you know, we're not going to want to distract the driver talking to them at times, other times we're going to want to be talking with them. So you need to be aware of the context. The other place where you can be aware of context as well is the, the scenario where you're going to be asking your device, for example, what's my appointment this afternoon? Or do I have any important email that came in? As it is right now, the device is going to respond. But as we talked about before, based on who is around you, you may not want to share that information. So on Smart Notify, what we do, we have a lot of patents and, and work built around that. We're trying to build more context into the communication stream. And we're seeing a lot of positive results and engagement from the end users where they don't have to necessarily speak what's on their mind to get the result they want. The other reason to, to want to be context aware is actually uh, not, not as fun. That, we're getting to the sad part of the presentation. But uh, if you ask women or minorities, unfortunately, they often get into more trouble when they ask for help. And trouble can range from uh, annoyance to, to major, major harassment, beat up, uh, very sad things. So if your device is getting to the point where it can know if the person talking to the device is in danger or because of the people who are around them may not want to share all the information, you're going to help them a lot. You know, the, um, we're doing this with chocolate. Again, if you go back to the slide and go on the link, you'll find out why we're doing this with chocolate. But we know of a few companies who are taking a similar approach. And it's pretty great to, to get to a point where IoT can make a real difference as opposed to just giving us sensors that give temperatures because, you know, do we really need to know the temperature went from 19.1 to 19.3 degrees? Not that much. So let's try to make this world a better place and to be context aware is a great one. Now, the reason you want to be careful with all these devices, whether you're a user or a consumer of the data they generate, is that oftentimes data is going to lie. And I want to spend a few a few minutes and a few slides of giving you some examples of data that was acquired through devices, uh, not necessarily Alexa, but very similar, and how they can really mess up your business or your analysis if you rely on them too blindly. Now, in this example, it's great. We, um, we actually ran into that company. They saw that cluster, that 17 number, that cluster of people uh, in Paris, and they got very excited. They, they engage an inane amount of money in both the software development to, to build recommendations around traffic. Those are the, the nice red lines you see there. And also some advertising so that based on your cluster, you would get some nice uh, movement and recommendation. Now, here's the part that sucked for them is that based on how your code is set up, the location of your device, and the carrier you're using, when you ask for a precise geolocation, the phone carrier may end up returning their, their data pipe access as opposed to your GPS access. And in that case, that 17 is one of the big um, French phone carrier data pipe. So for our customer, while well, they thought that all these people were there about to get out of work and needed help, it uh, turned out most of them were skiing in some far remote and exotic locations or doing other fun stuff but not being stuck in Paris. So don't trust the data blindly just because it's coming from an IoT device or just because it's coming from a source that you feel is reliable. And that's coming from the fact that, you know, we're flawed as humans. We, we all have flaws. And some people at times cheat 
and they will cheat knowingly, they will cheat unknowingly, but all that is going to go into the device. And if you think about it, those same flows are also going to, is also going to go into software. So it's unrealistic to think everything is going to be perfect. You know, uh, here's another example that's pretty fun. A lot of people use Fitbit, uh, including my, my mom. And Fitbit, for example, will tell you how many hours you slept at night, except that in her case, she loves to play Scrabble so much, let me take an example, that she takes her device and she becomes so stiff playing at Scrabble that her whole left arm does not move, which happens to be where the Fitbit is at. And she just plays Scrabble like this, like this. The result is that she's so still that the device thinks she's asleep and is going to be reporting sleep patterns and sleep recommendations are, you know, make no sense whatsoever. Now, if on top of that, you rely on that data, you in that case, the Fitbit API, but it could be any company, really, you're going to get a lot of messed up data if you're not able to do cleanup and just rely on IoT. Now, that's a security hole in a sense because once you start to get health data, you're going to want to make sure it's as accurate as you can so you can do good things with it and not harm people more. Uh, does not always have to be, um, to be drastic. You know, if you... Um, Oh, by the way, do not worry. We do have the the fire department right next door to the office, so that's why you hear the alarm sometimes. <laughs> uh, but anyway, another example of uh, of problematic data, and you're going to see how it relates to um, to Amazon in a minute. If you rely on on things, you know, lots of businesses built some operations around the Pokemon Go phase. If you want to have fun, go to Google. Google how to cheat at Pokemon Go, and you will get about 4 million results right away. And that's a case where people were faking geolocation, faking information, just to get to what they wanted. And the truth is, most of the time, people don't care about your device. They don't care about the software we do, we build. They just care about the reward that's behind it for them. And the bigger the reward, the more gamification there is. And I'll go on the record saying that when it comes to data, gamification sucks then you have a lot of hurdles to clear and your device will be returning things that's absolutely crazy. And, you know, I'm one of them and I know many of us are like this. Technically, Amazon Echo and Dot only work in US, Germany, and UK. Now, if you're in France like me or people in Italy, whose name shall not be mentioned because uh, I know them firsthand or other places around the world, what do you do? Well, you wait until it arrives in your country. Uh, if you're into innovation and, and new systems, that's not going to be an option because we're, we're innovators. We like to get our hands dirty as quickly as we can. So I know some people buy the device when they're in the U.S. or Germany or U.K., and they set it up there, and they bring it home, and all is fine, all is good. But I also know some people who go a lot further where get the device, and then you turn on a VPN so that Amazon server think you're in the US to get you started on uh, downloading the Amazon app. And then when you set it up, well, maybe you'll pick an address in Berlin or you pick an address in London. That way you can have some European setting around it. Now, how is that a bad thing? Well, if you're the end user, not much. But if you start to build services that are being delivered to those guys, that's when it becomes more problematic because some people are going to be using your, your technology, some people are going to be using your systems, and you're going to be getting fake and wrong data from them, and Amazon is going to give them bad recommendations. Now, here's a quick question to ponder. If you have a skill on Amazon, for example, or if you're a very small startup, even though you rely on Amazon, and something goes wrong, do you think people are going to be assuming it's because Amazon made a mistake or you made a mistake? Right. Usually, the bigger the company, the less mistake things uh, end user think they are they're responsible for. So it's very easy to fool these devices to get them set up. But then us as app makers or as IoT device makers, we're not going to know who is in a let's fool them mode or let's be a real user mode. So we want to be very careful from that standpoint of privacy. And honestly, we've seen this with many, many other devices. We've seen that with um, baby monitors. 
uh, that were very easy to hack into. I'm sure you've seen lots of cases as well. Sensors as well may not work as advertised or may return wrong data. We've seen a lot of examples lately with air quality systems that are being deployed. And of course, uh, temperature sensors where uh, you know, nowadays everybody wants to put a temperature sensor, but they happen to put it on the board itself uh, without thinking of the consequences of then the casing around the board and the, how it impacts the temperature. And all this leads to, to really the scary discovery um, or reinforcement, I should say, is that we're getting a lot of flow data because of those security holes and IoT holes. And this is leading to flawed businesses. For us, when we build IoT device, we're relying on a wrong architecture. And also, many other companies that do a recommendation are relying on data that's not accurate to do their recommendation. And in the end, everyone hurts and, uh, and gets problems out of it. So we need to be very careful when we build our product. And I'm hoping you guys, as you build new devices and do new things, really pay a lot of attention to how can you make your data so that your device, sorry, so that the data is as accurate and as relevant to the end user as possible? All right, we're getting to the end of the presentation today. Again, you guys can ask uh, questions on the on air section if you want. If not, uh, you're also welcome to ping me on Twitter at Pyramidium, and I will leave this running for a few minutes, after which you will shut down and you'll be able to, uh, to move to Twitter or to the forum section. Thank you very much for sticking with us for those two days of the uh, Intel Software Conference and looking forward to hearing what you guys are building and how you're planning on changing things with IoT. Thank you. Mm -hmm.